Welcome to the Real Estate Way to Wealth and Freedom podcast with Jacob Ayers, providing actionable content to help you along your journey to financial freedom through real estate investing. As the premier asset class, real estate has helped ordinary people just like you amass fortunes. The benefits of passive income from real estate investing will allow you to live a life you want. And now your host, entrepreneur, real estate investor, and apartment deal syndicator, Jacob Ayers. Welcome to the Real Estate Way to Wealth and Freedom podcast. You're listening to episode 260. Hi, I'm your host, Jacob Ayers. Welcome back to another great episode. I'm so glad you're here. Today, I'm excited to bring on our guest, Mike McCarthy. Mike is the co-founder of GoBundance, author of Tribe of Millionaires, serial entrepreneur, and speaker. Mike is also the regional owner of the Keller Williams Greater Pennsylvania region, where he oversees 50 offices and 8.5 thousand agents who closed on over 52,000 units in 2018 alone for over $14 billion. Today, I'm excited to bring Mike on the show, talk about the principles in his latest book, Tribe of Millionaires, get to know him, catch up with him. So without further ado, Mike, welcome on the show. Hey, I'm happy to be here, Jake. Thanks for the opportunity. Mike, it's our pleasure. I am so excited to have you on the podcast. Now, recently, I picked up and read a book that you co-authored with David Osborne, Pat Hyben, and Tim Rode titled Tribe of Millionaires. That book was so great, and I knew after I read it, I had to reach out, get you on the podcast not to mention a killer group of guys you got together and wrote a book with. So thanks so much for joining us. I'm excited to talk with you about the principles in this book, those six effects. And then before we get into all that, let's just back up. Can you tell the audience members a little bit about yourself, who you are, your background, your journey, and all of that good stuff with us? Yeah, absolutely. My pleasure to do that. I grew up in the real estate business. I'm what you call an SOB, a son of a broker, and uh, (laughs) have been in the business really since I was a little kid, helping him out. He was a manager of some real estate offices when I was a kid. And as I grew older into my teenage years, he became a Keller Williams manager. And he was really successful at that and got the opportunity to purchase the greater Pennsylvania region for Keller Williams, which he did so in 1999. And in 2001, I joined him as his assistant and got paid, I think, eight bucks an hour to do whatever he told me to do. And as part of that, I was also handling short-term lease rentals. That was a little side hustle I had going on. And so I basically learned real estate from my father. And more importantly, I came in to work with him at a time when He had just uh, seized an opportunity within Keller Williams. And luckily, at a young age, when my dad first joined Keller Williams, at 16, I was able to wrap my head around the business model. So at 16 years old, I had a very clear understanding of how the real estate industry and business worked from the brokerage perspective. And so when I graduated college and I joined my dad just because I didn't know what to do next, I wasn't sure that it was going to be an opportunity, but once I realized that Keller Williams was this incredible company that was innovating, that was changing lives, that was helping people build wealth, I just was like, how could I not be involved in Keller Williams? So I joined my dad and I started traveling from Colorado to Philly every two weeks and we would recruit top agents. And at some point, In that first year, I started doing a lot more of the talking and recruiting, and uh, slowly I picked it up. And by the end of the second year, I thought I knew everything again. So uh, (laughs) I had a regenesis of my sort of teenage, big-headed, kind of knew it all. I kind of was like, I got this. I can sell a franchise. And my dad and I kind of butted heads a bit, and he effectively retired and went to Florida and said, you know, if you're so smart, why don't you do all the work? 
And he gave me the freedom and the ability to go and become my own leader and business owner. And I did it all without owning any of the business. Obviously, now I've bought it from him and I'm the owner of it. He's still a partner, but it's really been an amazing journey of being mentored by my dad first, but he actually introduced me to David Osborne. And David has been my mentor for about 15 years now. And he is my partner and co-author of Tribe of Millionaires as well. And so I'm lucky to have had a father who is a business leader and also introduced me to the concept that we really key on in the book, which is that I needed to be more selective about who I was hanging out with. And I was able to do that through Keller Williams and eventually through GoBundance, but it's been a wild ride. And we have an incredible business now in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Delaware. We've got over 9,000 agents. We did over $14 billion in sales last year. And so it's a nice little business and it affords us the opportunity to be investors in all kinds of other businesses and real estate and to do things like go abundance with our time and write tribe of millionaires. So it's been a wild ride. Yeah, that's great. So backing up, you go to work for your dad at an early age. And I think many people out there, if they haven't had the opportunity to work for their parents at an early age, you uh, probably scathe by without some of those hardships, right? I know what it was like working for my dad at an early age for that $8 an hour. Coincidentally enough, I made the same. So lots of hard work goes into that. And they don't cut you any slack, right? So you really uh, probably learned a lot on the job. But that's an interesting angle and an approach that's not so common for real estate investors. I see most real estate investors, I feel, are like professionals turned investors, whether that's engineer or accountants or doctors or attorneys or whoever it might be. There's very few people, at least in my perspective, that go into real estate investing from the sales side of things. So tell us like what that was and some of the foundations and base knowledge you carried with you to be able to be a successful real estate investor? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, for me, it was just being close enough to the transaction to understand that it makes a lot of sense to buy real estate and then wait. And what most people do is they wait to buy real estate. And I learned that, but it didn't really register until I started getting around the GoBundance guys because I'm a more heart-centered people person. I'm more of a visionary and a leader and a strategist. I'm not as much of a number cruncher, analyze deals or go in and flip a property or you know renovate and turn around a property. So for me, the difference was that Keller Williams teaches leverage at a really high level. And they teach that there's lots of different ways to build wealth. And one of the ways that they teach is to own businesses. And so that was actually my first way of building wealth was to try to find ways to get sweat equity or to get equity at the beginning of either a Keller Williams franchise launch or maybe a mortgage company or a title company and to really find those opportunities. We also have a profit share system within Keller Williams. So it's, you know, it was also a way to make passive income by growing the company as a whole. So I just went all in on my business, my main business, which was brokerages and all of the ancillary businesses that surround that. And once I had made enough money, which is really what you alluded to, the same way that an accountant or an engineer or a doctor goes into real estate, is that even though I was in the real estate business, I really needed a way to invest into real estate that was much more passive. And the reason was because I already had a bunch of side hustles. Like my side hustles were finding equity and growing Keller Williams. Like if I had extra time, it was going to go into building a business and or growing Keller Williams, which I was doing simultaneously. But here's what happened is going all in on one business did two things. It created success and wealth that was on a multiple basis. So You know, I now have a business that I own that's worth multiples of its profit. So that's a big, big wealth building tool right there. And it's kicking off uh, residual income. And in many cases, you know, it's a business run by other people. So I'm just the leader and the boss. And that doesn't mean I just tell people what to do and that's it. It means that I have to create a place where they can thrive. I have to help them shine. I have to put them in a position to win. And when they win, I've got to make sure they're well taken care of. But 
For me, it was about finding a place to invest and go all in, which was Keller Williams. Once I was successful, then I needed to learn where am I going to put the money that I'm making from that success. And so that's when I started hanging out with GoBundance guys and getting introduced to syndicated apartment deals and finding ways for me to invest passively in real estate where I was leveraging that I'm an accredited investor. So I think the overall lesson in all of that, Jake, for everybody that's listening and they're wanting to become an investor is like, you need money to invest. If you don't have money, you've got to be willing to go out and do some sweat equity. And I've done both on both sides. I've invested money, I've earned sweat equity. So I know what it's like. And at the end of the day, that's where you have to start investing is in yourself. Because in order to to seize those opportunities to get equity, whether it's through sweat or through financial, you've got to be in a position to win. And that requires you to develop yourself personally. And so, you know, I think the biggest investment that we make is in ourselves. And the second biggest investment we make is in who we surround ourselves with. And I think that leads us to the money we're going to make and the deals that we have in front of us that we're able to to take advantage of. So that's a long answer for how I invest. But I don't think my path is going to be the same as everybody because not everybody is an entrepreneur. And I think when you are, you don't really have as much time to invest except for in your business. Once you crush it in that business... Now you have probably enough capital to go and and, and become an investor. So that would be my advice. Yeah, I love how you break that down. The first and most important step is to invest in yourself. And then that second step is investing in your surroundings, who you surround yourself with, kind of your peer group, right? And I know you're really big on that. So talk to us a little bit about the importance of having just a strong network and a circle of friends who are, you know, lifting you up and doing what you're doing and helping you push forward. Yeah, well, without sounding too basic, you know, we're we're the we're the average of the five people we spend the most time with. And, you know, you can look at that from any angle as a father, as a husband, as a business partner, as a son or daughter. You can look at, you know, your role in any particular area and you can clearly see that influence of those around you determines a lot of how you act and behave and talk. And we see this in many different ways. It first manifests as like, you know, maybe when we become aware of it as peer pressure as a teenager, like, hey, I'm hanging around these people and they're doing these things. And all of a sudden, doing those things, which maybe used to be outside of my values, are now something that I'm willing to do. Mm -hmm. And it happens in an instant, just like that. And, you know, we wrote a tribe of millionaires that the book, which is all about six effects that our main character, Ethan, experiences throughout the book. It's a parable. We wrote it as such because we love the teaching through a story. We think it's captivating to read that way. It is really intriguing the way you guys wrote that book. I'm purely like a nonfiction reader, right? I'm always reading business books and self-improvement and real estate. So when I saw this book, I was like, "Mm, a story, I don't know. It's not what I'm usually into, but I'm so glad I picked it up. It's a phenomenal book. Kind of tell us a little bit. You started to before I so rudely interrupted you, but it's a parable about Ethan. And tell us a little bit about this book and the, the principles in it. Yeah, I would be happy to. You know, Tribe of Millionaires is like the culmination of, in many ways, you could look at 15 years of an accountability partnership that started with Pat Hyben and David Osborne, and then they added Tim Rode. And I was what you call the fourth amigo because they were the three (laughs) amigos for many, many years before I came along. But they were my mentors and they helped me uh, much the way that Ethan is helped in the book by the Tribe of Millionaires. So The story is not about me, by the way. I don't want to allude to that. The story of Ethan is about any one of our members' journeys of learning about GoBundance, if you will. And so obviously, just draw the connection. GoBundance is the real life tribe of millionaires. And in the book, tribe of millionaires is really everything that GoBundance is. And Ethan, it's interesting because Ethan is estranged from his father and I won't go into too many more details or give much, too much away, but you know, many of us can relate to having challenges with our fathers 
or our parents in general. And it's interesting, like the first people that we surround ourselves with are generally our parents, right? And so Mm -hmm. we're massively influenced by them. And, you know, for me in particular, I'm a controlling person. My dad is a controlling person. You know, you put the two together and it's a fireball, you know, waiting to explode a little bit. But what's interesting is that, you know, Ethan's journey, much like my own, was that in the end, he realized that his dad had his back all along, that is that he was his dad's big why and reason. And that, you know, in the end, we all have to go through that, whether we knew our parents or we didn't, or we had relationships that were good or bad, their influence over us is something that we feel right away. And so the story of Ethan is the story of an entrepreneur who's, you know, not got a great relationship with his father, but in the story the tribe emerges as his father figure. And they're able to help influence him in ways much like a negative peer group in, as a teenager might influence you, but in a positive way. So Ethan is able to have instant shifts in his mindset, his approach to life, his resourcefulness, his ability to solve problems. But it all comes from the different effects. The first effect is the influence effect, which is that your destiny is shaped by those around you. And the idea of the influence effect is that the most important influence in your life is people, but it's also your environment and that we are a product of our environment. It's constantly influencing us both unconsciously and consciously. We're being influenced by the room, the lighting, the sound, the presence of other people, their interaction with us, all of it is having an influence on us. And so you could look at it as your environment is stronger than you are. So you really have to be super smart about putting the right people around you. And when you do, the right people will give you creativity, clarity, and through that connectivity to other people, you can multiply your results. So the second effect in Tribe of Millionaires is the multiplier effect. And that is that the right group of people will compound your effort. And so when you get clear and you get creative, you're able to be more resourceful and have the answers that you need. Now, having the answers isn't going to do it though. You got to take action (laughs) on your own. Your peer group isn't going to do the work for you. So you've got influence effect, you've got multiplier effect, I'll go through the next couple effects, but let me see if you have any reflections on the first couple or anything to add. Yeah, sure. Just on that influence effect, when I read the book, one thing I realized was there are so many things, like you mentioned, that are surrounding you that you might not be aware of that are really impacting your outcome, your results, your mindset. Just for instance, like the temperature in the room or you know, the lighting, like you said, or the sounds. Is it quiet around you? Is it loud? Is there something in the background that's kind of annoying you? Are you able to get, you know, fully focused on the task at hand or is that beeping outside bugging you. So when I read that, I was like, that's really interesting. And it made me think of my surroundings a lot more specifically after reading that. So definitely something to think of there. Yeah. Yeah. Good, good insight. Yeah. And so, you know, just to continue on some of the effects, because I think what you realize is that You can harness these effects to propel your life forward, or you can just not pay attention to them at all. And it's likely that the effects are having a negative impact in your life, that you're not strategic or thoughtful in who and what you're surrounded by. And so you end up with a default position. And in this instance, we're preaching that if you want to have a life of abundance, you need to live a life by design. And that requires you to purposely put the right people around you that can influence you, that can give you a multiplier effect on your outcomes. And then the third effect is the accountability effect. And it's that responsibility to others is the world's most powerful force. That's the tagline for the accountability effect. And what's amazing is that the reason it's the most powerful force in the world is because we're hardwired to want to fit into a tribe, to a village. Because... When we were, you know, hundreds of thousands of years ago, we needed to be in these communities in order to live, in order to survive. And it was just known that you alone couldn't do it, that you had to be connected to others. And so there's this innate desire for us to fit in. And so when we say we're going to do something to a group, 
and it's known that we're an accountable group and that, hey, I'm putting this out there, it requires you to shift and make changes and do things that maybe you thought were not possible before. But now with the help of accountability, you realize that it's possible. I'm just going to have to work every day on it. I'm going to have to go all in on it. And when you can get people around you and you access this hidden power that's hardwired into our software and our hardware, then we're able to become whatever the group is right away. If you're hanging out with millionaires who don't party a lot, who are disciplined and who treat their bodies right and who take care of the planet and their relationships and also contribute a lot in the world, well, you're probably not going to feel very comfortable going out partying really late, womanizing people, treating other people badly and not contributing to society. Whereas if I'm around guys and that's what they're doing, I have to make that shift or I can't be in that group anymore. I've got to go somewhere else, especially if the group is willing to call it out. So and in GoBundance, we call it extreme accountability because it's not about being friends. It's also not about just beating people up and you know, for results, but it's about being caring and loving enough to actually tell people what you think and that you think they could do better, even if you want to celebrate where they are right now. So the third effect is accountability. I'll go into a few others, but uh, any thoughts on the accountability? Yeah, I like that accountability effect because you, when you hear the word accountability, you think that you're being accountable to somebody else and following somebody else's rules, but really it's the opposite. You're holding yourself accountable to your own standards. I've experienced this myself recently. I uh, formed a little bit of a, an accountability group exactly is what it is with a few guys from across the country, somewhat in our same time zone. But I don't know these guys other than through the calls we have every week. And we connect every Saturday and we lay out our goals for the week and we tell each other what we're going to do. And then the next Saturday, we connect and we say, well, how'd you do on that? Now, I don't owe these guys anything, but I know throughout the week when it comes Tuesday and Wednesday and I said, hey, I'm going to do X, I still haven't done it yet. Something clicks in my mind and I say, I've got to get this done. I've got to talk with these guys on Saturday. They know I said I was going to do X, Y, and Z and I'm only at X so far. So there is some kind of innate kind of trigger deep in your mind that is activated just by having this accountability group. Yeah, absolutely. Well, way to tap into, you know, a resource that you already have within you, which is the desire to be part of a tribe and way to <laughs> way to go out and connect to a tribe and to find that accountability and way to step up. And what's interesting is that while the influence and the multiplication and the accountability are all really, really important, what I love about the fourth effect, Jake, is that the authenticity effect really reveals to us that without bringing your true self, you don't actually get the power of the influence and the multiplier and the accountability. So we've got to be authentic. And the, the effect states that you find your true self among those you trust. And the reason is because if somebody can reflect back to me what I'm not seeing about myself, but they can do it in a way which is safe, meaning I trust them, then I'm instantly able to see things that I might not want to see, but I can see them in a way where I can act upon them positively and address them without ever having to go into the guilt and the shame and the feeling that like, man, I shouldn't be this way. And I think a lot of times we don't want to change because we think there's some sort of like guilt or shame that comes along with it where we feel like we're more messed up than everybody else is. And the reality is, is that we are human beings and by nature, we are flawed. We are imperfect. We are works in progress. That's the whole reason we're here. If you're living, if you're breathing, then you're still here to grow as a person. I'm not talking about your bank account or your investment portfolio or even the number of relationships you have. You are here in order to grow as a soul, as a spirit, as an infinite being. And I know I might be crossing into some esoteric like, you know, belief systems where people may not fully believe, but here's what I know. You did not create yourself. Let's all just get on the same page. Of, <laughs> like you didn't create yourself. Somebody helped to create you. And whatever that is, whatever that energy, call it your parents, call it nature, call it the universe, call it God, what it wants for us all, Jake, is to realize our full potential, is to understand that we have no idea what we're capable of. And every day we get up and we argue for our limitations because 
we operate from a set of programs and beliefs that tell us what's possible. Instead of working to go beyond that set of emotions, feelings, and beliefs that we're stuck in this spiral, this loop, if we want to break beyond that, we have to show up as who we are, which is flawed and not all together. And by the way, I'm talking about showing up in a room full of millionaires and letting everybody know whether you're a millionaire or not, a room full of millionaires does not, they do not have it all figured out. They don't have life figured out. They don't have their business figured out yet. They don't even have investing figured out yet. What they've done is they've figured it out to a certain level financially, and that's one area. So what I'm getting at is that we have to show up and be willing to be who we are, not send in our representative or our agent to show up as our social media profile. But we have to actually put our shoes and socks on and get out in the world, preferably wear some pants and a shirt too, right? (laughs) Get out there and be yourself because when you are and you're around a group that you trust, they can help you be who you're capable of becoming instead of who you are today. It doesn't mean that you're not great today. You are amazing. You're everything that you could become to this point and you're capable of so much more moving forward. So trust allows the authenticity and the accountability to work. It enables the influence to work. It enables the multiplier to work. So I love that fourth lesson, the authenticity, because if there's one thing that we do well in GoBundance is it's authentic. And this to me is one of the hardest effects, Mike, is, you know, in kind of today's environment and world of social media, you compare yourself almost subconsciously all the time to people's highlight reels and you're comparing yourself, you know, your first step to somebody's 100th step. And so it's really hard sometimes to be authentic and just kind of self-reflective. But when you've got that group of people that you trust, like you said, your tribe or your accountability group, you can go and say, hey, I'm having trouble with this or I'm not quite doing well here in this area. I feel like I'm lacking. And chances are those people are probably experiencing some of the same challenges you are. So I think that's a really hard one to kind of practice, if you will. Yeah. Well, I think that I heard the quote somewhere. I forget what it is. I think first time you hear a quote, you give it a direct credit. The second time it was just someone said it. And then the third time it was my idea, right? (laughs) Um, Yeah. So, but the thought is that we shouldn't compare our insides to other people's outsides. And I think that that makes a lot of sense to me is that, you know, we can't see what's going on inside of anybody, but I guarantee you everybody's got their things. And, and so just knowing that should put us in a place where we're willing to just bring that. And I also, I want to point out something that my friend Nick Santana Sasso taught me, and he's a gentleman with no legs and one arm and on his one arm, he has one finger. And This is an individual who skateboards, wake surfs, now snowboards and bodybuilds and walks New York Fashion Week as a runway model. He's a best-selling author and he's a motivational speaker that tours with Tony Robbins. And here's a kid who's 24, 23 maybe. And his parents just said to him, Nick, the world is not going to change for you. Like you've got to just step up. And so he did. And guess what though? Guess what he realized after feeling really bad about who he was because people don't understand his condition. They don't know how to deal with it. They don't know how to approach him. And so there's this natural isolation that comes that is not on purpose. But here's what happened is that at some point in Nick's life, he realized that whether it's for a girl in his life or for friends in his life or for business partners or whatever, his condition was the ultimate authenticity filter because people either would want to be around it and be okay with it and understand it or they wouldn't. And he didn't want to be around anybody who wasn't open, authentic, loving, caring, receptive, whatever. Now, Pretend that you're not Nick. Pretend that you are yourself and not Nick for a minute. So get outside of the story. So you have a full body. You've got two arms, two legs, whatever. Guess what? You going out and being authentic in the world is like your filter to make sure you're only around caring, loving, amazing, supportive people. So be yourself. 
If some people don't like you and they want to not be around you because of that, that's great. Let them go be around other people. So I look at it this way. If you're not yourself, you're going to find out that you're hanging out with a lot of people you don't want to hang out with. So you've got to break through that barrier and be who you are and then go find people that you admire and respect and love and go be around them. And uh, guess what? They will probably be genuine, kind, helpful, supportive. And usually the higher level of success they are, what I've noticed is quite the opposite of what you might think is there's a willingness to help. They just don't get asked a lot. It's like the hot chick syndrome, right? Like they're (laughs) just so hot. They don't get asked out ever, right? But there's a key to that is you have to be willing to be authentic with them. And that doesn't mean, by the way, sometimes people say, well, I'm just being authentic. If you don't like me, then, you know, that's just your problem. Well, no, that's just you excusing being an asshole. That's different than authenticity. Now, if you're authentically an asshole, then sure, this is (laughs) you. But that's not authenticity. That's just you allowing yourself to be an asshole. So I think authenticity is the secret formula that enables us to become successful. And without it, we don't get to tap the power of those around us. And we don't get to also become our best self and uncover our gifts and learn who we are. And that's the fifth effect actually goes into that. It's the purpose effect is number five. And it's that the right people reveal your richest source of power. And your richest source of power is your big why. It's your reason for living. And, you know, it's lots of things, not one thing. Like a big why for me is my family, but I don't live my life just for them either. I live my life because you know, at the end of the day, I know I have an innate purpose, a reason to be here. And part of that is being a father. But part of it is also leaving a mark, a legacy in the world. And it's not what I'm leaving as much as what I'm giving. And it's giving it while I'm still here and being willing to understand that wealth is really just a tool that helps me to uncover more clearly, at least it has for me, I know it does for others. It's not the only way to uncover your purpose, by the way. But what you find is a lot of people that make money, they end up unhappy. And that what they realize is that they don't have a purpose anymore. They never had one to begin with. The purpose was making money. But once they make all the money, then they're left with a void. The void is what is your actual gift to the world? What are you going to give it while you're here? And it's not, it probably isn't your business. If you already built it up and you sold it or your business is successful, that's great. You're awesome. And maybe it even is a business that cleaning the ocean. So it's serving an incredible purpose. That doesn't mean that it's your only purpose in life. There's a deeper level. And it's actually a string of purpose that we are on. And our purpose might be connected to another's purpose. And I think it's important to realize that when we don't go out and be who we need to be in the world, and serve our purpose, we might not be the other link in the chain that someone else needs in order to fully recognize their purpose. And if we look at ourselves as all links in a chain, for instance, and the link being the ability to uncover our purpose, that's a big deal. That's life. You know, that's beyond business, beyond relationships. This is about like, why am I here on this planet? And it's a big question. And it's one that is related to those around you because the people who you're most connected with through authenticity, accountability, multiplication, and influence, they are going to make sure that they keep you reminded of what your gift is to the world, of keeping you on your purpose and making sure that you execute on whatever your gift is to the world. Yeah. And sometimes just identifying that purpose might can seem like a daunting challenge. Maybe somebody's out there in their early 20s and like, I don't know. I don't have this whole thing figured out yet. I don't exactly know what my purpose is. I'm still on that mission. That's okay. And your purpose will change over time. Like you said, you might, Mm -hmm. you know, swing to the next link and, you know, this is just a step for the next one, for the next one. And maybe somebody swings in and now you join forces and, you know, you're on a common mission. So I would say to people out there, you don't have to have your purpose figured out yet. Is that fair? Yeah, I haven't. I don't know that I figured mine out yet. And I'm 41 and I have multiple businesses and, you know, I've had a lot of success. I got a more clear picture about what it is. And I know that it's connected to whatever my highest strengths are, which is a beautiful thing because if I can just bring my highest strengths, which is easy for me, right? Like 
That's easy. By the way, it's also fun. By the way, it's also effective. I'm effective at it. And I think sometimes we feel like our purpose needs to be saving the oceans or feeding the hungry or curing homelessness, which maybe it is. But at the end of the day, it's how can you just embrace who you are right now in whatever the highest good is in this moment, which is think about all the miracles that are around you right now, technology and lights and houses and structures and food. And, you know, there's all of these things that in the moment I can connect with that connect me to maybe not some esoteric purpose that is my life's purpose, but in this moment, my purpose is to serve. It's to make the room filled with more positive energy, more laughter, more joy, more love. It's to lift others up. It's also to be willing to let others lift us up when we need to be down by asking for help. But I think you discover your purpose through presence is my point, through presence in a a moment and coming alive in that moment, because then you are living your presence. You're bringing your strengths to the moment. And when we're present, we come alive. And so I think that the idea of having a purpose is a complicated one, like you say, But serving a purpose, that's really easy. You serve a purpose right now. We're serving a purpose right now. We're recording a podcast that's hopefully going to make one person or more think differently, right? I know that probably two people will think differently because of this conversation at a minimum, me and you. Absolutely. So we shape our relationships, our reality through these conversations. And that's part of the effect of the power and the effect that people have on us. Yeah, that's awesome. So this is the fifth effect, the purpose effect. You can see how this book is laid out and kind of guides you to, you know, understanding these effects. And that's what exactly what Ethan, the main character in the book is doing as this journey is progressing throughout this book where he comes to the final sixth effect, right? Yep. So that is the connection effect. So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. So the connection effect is the surprise ending to the story is that the only thing that actually mattered was people. Like at the end of it all, if you want to die and have no regrets, the only thing that you're going to care about is the relationships that you have. So the beginning of the book is like, you need people so you can get where you need to go. And then the surprise ending of the story is that the only reason to go anywhere is to be with the people. And so it's just a beautiful ending of the story to to share that connection effect, which is that your life will be measured by the quality of your relationships. And it's ultimately going to be back connected to your purpose because it's, it's not only just the relationships that supported you, but it's also going to be, you know, now you're at, you know, maybe the top of some mountain in your life. Hopefully we all get there at some point. And that's the point when we got to, as my friend Chris Lockhead would say, throw down the rope and help the next man to come up to the top of the mountain, next man or woman. And you know, it's that service to others. So not just the relationships we have with people, that's going to matter, but how we served in those relationships. That is the only thing that's going to matter when you're on your last breath. And so we love the story because it reveals to you that the only thing that matters in life is the people that are in your life. And taking care of those people is your role as a human being. And when I say those people, I meet it in the broadest sense of the term that you can imagine. Like we are connected to everyone and everything and we ought to be taking care of everyone and everything. And if, if you think somebody is bad in the world, you should really start trying to find a way to love them because they need the love more than anybody else. So to be putting people in a place where they're wrong and they're bad, and I do this all the time. I'm not immune to this. But I need the reminder that what they need is love. What the world needs is love. And I know that sounds like some airy-fairy crap to maybe some people out there, but that's it, man. It's all about love. Well, just imagine if that were the case, right? Imagine if everybody had that same perspective, what the world would look like. It would be remarkable. And I think the world is coming to that. I think it's coming to those conclusions on its own. I think we've had a regenesis of an awakening. I think you see learning communities right now are at their peak. I can't remember the, there was some Tony Robbins sponsored video going around that shared the stats on 
the industry of learning communities, mastermind groups, seminars, online courses, that industry is going to crazy numbers in the future. It's predicted to be. Obviously, that could change. But I think the reason is because people are waking up and they're not wanting to be just accepting the status quo of what their life could hold. I think they're wanting the most that they can get out of their life experience. And I think they're realizing that all of these institutions in the world that are out there are really getting in between us and our experience of life and each other. And so we're recreating a lot of institutions in this world. And GoBundance is one of them. You know, we want to disrupt the way that education is done. We have all of our kids, not GoBundance as a whole, but my close friends and I, we have our kids enrolled in Acton Academy because we don't want our kids becoming factory line industrialized workers. We want them to be creative, visionary executors in the world and entrepreneurs. And that's so they're at a school called Acton Academy that's based out of Austin. And so, you know, that's an area where, you know, we've got to continually disrupt and wake people up to their potential, to their abilities, to their life having meaning. And I think too many people have already written themselves off and we need to get them to get back online. I love it. Mike, this book is called Tribe of Millionaires. Obviously, I'm a huge proponent of it. I recommend everybody to go out there and pick up a copy. Now, the real life Tribe of Millionaires is actually a real organization that you have co-founded called GoBundance. I want to get to that in a minute. But before we do that, let's kind of back up and talk about someone who's listening to this conversation right now. All of these effects in Tribe of Millionaires are resonating with them. It's sounding like a brillant path for them to start, but they don't exactly know what that first step is. What would you tell that person? What's that first action step for them? Yeah, well, I mean, I'm going to give you the actual answer that will serve you and not me. And that is that the actual action step is to go find an accountability partner, follow Jake's lead and go build a little pod that you meet with every Saturday on Zoom or get face to face with. Like that is the ultimate step because, you know, I don't know where you're at in your entrepreneurial journey. And, you know, if you're just starting out, you should check out an organization called OneLifeFullyLived.org. It's the number one, LifeFullyLived.org. And they have a roadmap and a community on Facebook that is really pretty much free. It's a nonprofit. So it's very, very, I think the roadmap, the workbook you do is very inexpensive. And then the community online is free. And so that would be a place to start. If you don't know any people you could start connecting with that are like-minded, that are ambitious, that want more out of life, that would be a great community to start would be One Life Fully Live. The other answer would be this. If you're an entrepreneur and you're doing good and you just know you want to do better, then you could consider checking out GoBundance.com and you could look at our Aspen retreat, which is the last week of January. And we'll have about 175 millionaires that are at that event. The qualifications to attend are that you have to be an accredited investor. But we do have spots for about 15 that don't qualify to go to that event. Just so we can pour into them, that they can get something out of it. And hopefully, we start to build our next generation of entrepreneurs and millionaires that way. So there is, if somebody wanted to get with us and actually experience it, That's at the end of January in Aspen. It's our pinnacle annual event. So getting face-to-face is always, always a great idea. And then the other thing is, is if you don't have a copy of the book yet, you can get one for free on tribeofmillionaires.com. And all you have to pay is shipping and handling, and then we send you a book. And you can also on tribeofmillionaires.com, you can do a tribal strength assessment and you can assess how strong is your tribe currently at supporting your goals? And that is super enlightening way to just understand, like put a value to it. How well is your tribe supporting you right now? Just so you have a a benchmark and an understanding, but those would be the places to go. And if somebody wanted to just get in touch with me, go mikemccarthy.com is where everything me is stored. It's the most underutilized website on the planet. It would be cool to get one person to go to it. (laughs) We'll we'll link in the show notes for audience members to find. Mike, before we wrap up here, tell us just a little bit more about GoBundance, what you guys do, your principles, your philosophies, and just kind of your your mission statement, if you will. 
Yeah, well, we're the tribe for healthy, wealthy, generous badasses who choose to lead epic lives. And we are uh, built around uh, six pillars, which are adventure, which is bucket list adventures, age-defying health, extreme accountability, genuine contribution, horizontal income, and authentic relationships. And horizontal income is just our term to describe passive income. But we're built on those six pillars. We're 250 member mastermind right now. We do one international 10-day bucket list adventure every year. The guys just got back from Patagonia. I was moving to Austin, so I couldn't go on that one, unfortunately. We do two annual retreats. The one in Aspen is our winter, and we do another one in the summer in August that's generally in Austin, Texas. Everybody wants to go to Austin, Texas in the summer, right? So, uh, <laughs> and then we have a Cuba trip coming up in March. And then we have a, several local chapters of GoBundance. So there's about 10 cities that are having regular meetings right now. If you're interested in, in going to a local GoBundance a chapter meeting, whether you qualify for GoBundance or not, there might be some openings there. You could just email me directly at mikemccarthy at me.com. And I would have you cc info at gobundance.com as well. But that would be a way you could link in. Those are newly formed this year. So we don't even have them like up on a website or dates published, but they're meeting monthly and they're in nine or so cities right now meeting monthly. But GoBundance at the core of it is a mastermind group, but without a guru. And not that there's a challenge with being a guru or that we have any problems with mastermind groups that do have gurus. We think that's effective, but we're more interested in that in unlocking the collective wisdom within the group. And we're more interested in having the group support each other than for there to be one person with all the answers that top of the organization. And so at our events, we crowdsource wisdom from our members and they do a little mini TED Talks that we call Go Talks. And we also have an accountability sheet called the One Sheet. It's your life on an entire baseball card type sheet. It's got your health, your wealth, your contribution, your, you know, your income. It's got everything that's there where you can see it. That's what we use to mastermind on because obviously that breeds accountability and authenticity. That sheet does. And obviously in the book, Ethan does a one sheet with the tribe of millionaires. So that's <laughs> reluctantly, <like>. right? <laughs> yep. Yeah. He's because he doesn't want the accountability and he doesn't want to have to be that transparent about how messed up things are. Right. So when you put it all on paper, you're either confirming the lie officially that you're sticking to it, or you're creating a space to finally let it out, let the genie out of the bottle or let, you know, let the cat out of the bag, so to speak, and finally get the help that you need. But we're a super authentic group and we support each other at the highest level. And one thing that I love most about GoBundance is that we created an entire mastermind group for our families too. And so an entire family can join FamBundance and my wife leads two retreats a year for the wives and they do wisdom circles that are accountability groups like the one you do every Saturday yeah, morning right. where they do that virtually. They do stuff like that. And then um, we actually have programs for our junior dream leaders, which are kids that are 10 and under. Both of my kids are in that category. That's great. And then we have stuff for our NGLs, our next generation leaders, and that's our teens. And so we have full programming for those three category of individual because what I realized very, very quickly, Jake, when I took over as CEO of GoBundance about four years ago, is that if this wasn't also going to serve my family, then I couldn't do it. And so we created events. We do uh, several events every year that are for families. And we mastermind with families together. And what we mastermind on is we help them create shared values, shared visions, collective goals a future bucket list and adventures that they want to go on together. And they create a family operating system. And what that does, Jake, I'll just share really quick, is that it takes a really powerful stance on something that I am very passionate about. And that is that most entrepreneurs, they leave their families and then they use their families as the excuse for why they're away. And then why they're away from their families building businesses and doing all of their things, they grow apart from their family. 
And they do it because they say they're supporting the family and they're doing it for them to leave them what? A legacy, money, finances? Okay, well, fast forward to the day when these children who have not been around their dad or their mom who built all the wealth is now expected to manage that wealth or to shoulder the burden of it or to deal with the complexity of it. One of two things is going to happen to that, those children. Either they're going to realize or they're either going to fear and worry that they're not going to be able to handle it or worse, they're going to realize that they weren't ready to handle it and they're going to blow it all, which happens consistently on second generation and third generation entrepreneurs. And you only need to look at like the Vanderbilt example to really get clear on this. In the 80s, they had a Vanderbilt family reunion and there wasn't a single millionaire in attendance. And in the late 1800s, the Vanderbilts were the most wealthy family in the world. It was rumored that they were, I mean, not confirmed, but they were supposedly and allegedly the most powerful and influential wealthy family. And what they didn't do is pass, create a system to pass down values. They did not create a system to pass down interaction and inclusion in the business and what was happening. So what we teach is that entrepreneurs should actually, if they're successful at some point, they should pivot and 100% of their effort should go into their family, into values, into goals, into meeting with their family even, the way that they might meet with their team. Because most families don't even have family meetings, and yet they're building a legacy for their family, but their family doesn't even have any values or shared goals or anything. So what are they really doing? They're just escaping from their family, and they're using the family as an excuse. And it's the thing that if I were to say, what's my purpose in life? The thing that I've got most clear on is that that's my purpose, is to make sure that not only I do this in my own family, but I inspire as many other entrepreneurs as I can to make sure that they actually put their family first, which is what they're saying that they're doing anyways. But do they actually have it in their schedule? Do they have retreats with them? Do they do seminars with them? Do they go on bucket list adventures with them? Probably not, but they should. So I love it. Mike, hey, you practice what you preach. You alluded to, you just moved to Austin, Texas. I would assume one of those reasons is to be closer to your tribe, enroll your kids in a school that you wanted them to be in, and just overall improve the quality of your life. So you're really out there doing what you're talking about and living this life that you've kind of laid out in GoBundance and subsequently Tribe of Millionaires. So great. And then also, welcome to Texas. (laughs) Yeah, thanks, man. Happy to be here. We're loving it. We really are. Well, Mike, hey, it's been a lot of fun having you on the podcast. So much great content here. For the listeners who haven't yet, please go out to www.tribeofmillionaires.com. Pick up that free book. Just pay the shipping and handling. It's a solid, great book. I highly recommend it, obviously. Mike, if the audience members want to go and learn more, reach out to you. Is the best place, gobundance.com, Tribe of Millionaires. What's the, what's the yeah, best landing If they're page? interested in one of those organizations, fambundance.com, gobundance.com. They can check out tribeofmillionaires.com. And if they want to just connect with me directly, if they want me to facilitate uh, something, a mastermind, a group, a meeting, I do that. There's information on kind of what I offer and what I do on my website, but uh, happy to connect with anybody that needs help. And one more time, your personal website was, what was that for the listeners? It's, it's gomikemccarthy.com. So, gomikemccarthy.com. Yeah, Mike Mike. McCarthy.com was $20,000. So I went with gomikemccarthy.com. That sounds like a reasonable <laughs> deal. <laughs> well, Mike, hey, thanks so much for coming on the show. It's been so fun having you on. Yeah, my pleasure, man. Great work. Great conversation. Thanks. Take care, Mike. <laughs> awesome. All right, that wraps up this week's episode with our guest, Mike McCarthy. Hey, what an awesome conversation with Mike today. I hope you got so much value out of today's episode. For all of those resources we mentioned in the conversation, you can find those in the show notes or simply visiting www.jacobayers.com forward slash 260. Some of those we mentioned were onelifefullylived.org, of course, Mike's contact information, gobundance.com, and the website for Tribe of Millionaires book, which I highly recommend you go over there 
All you have to do is pay the shipping and handling, and you can have a paperback copy of that book. So great. Once again, go over and do that. It's tribeofmillionaires.com. As always, I hope you're getting value from this podcast. If you like what you heard today, please go over and leave a rating and review on whichever platform. As always, for more information, resources, and to connect with me, you can do so at www.jacobayers.com. Till next week, engineer the lifestyle you want. You've been listening to the Real Estate Way to Wealth and Freedom podcast, providing you actionable content to build your real estate empire. Nothing on this show should be considered specific, personal, or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, financial, or business professional for personal advice. The opinions of guests are their own. Information is not guaranteed. All investment strategies have a potential for profit or loss. The host is operating on behalf of the Real Estate Way to Wealth and Freedom, LLC, exclusively.